Welcome to the Windsor Essex County Health Unit's media briefing for Thursday, August the 18th. We are joined today by our CEO, Nicole Dupuy, and our Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shanker Nesathure. Dr. Shanker Nesathure is available via audio only today as uh, his camera is out of service. We have no opening statements to begin with, so we're going to move right into questions from our, our media partners. Uh, we will open the floor with Adele from Blackburn. Good morning. Uh, the first question I have is about is about the availability of pediatric doses. Uh, there was some chatter on our social media. We had a couple of inquiries as well, saying that people were having some difficulty accessing those. Could you tell me what the supply has been like and if there were problems, if they have been cleared up? Um, so the, Nicole, maybe you, you could sure, uh, I can start comment and, on and, that, yeah. Yeah, I can start. And I can um, supplement it, yeah. Sure. So thanks for the question. Um, yeah, we have heard the same. Um, I can assure you that there is availability of pediatric doses. So actual supply of vaccine is not a concern. Um, they're maybe not as widely available across the community um, as uh, the adult vaccination. So not as many um, healthcare providers or pharmacists are participating in delivering the pediatric vaccine, but there definitely are pharmacies um, that are offering the pediatric vaccine. Um, you can go to our website and you can see the list of participating pharmacies um, as well. Certainly, we encourage individuals to talk to their healthcare provider. Um, pediatric doses do need to be coordinated with other vaccines. So it is, you know, important that individuals, if they can, talk to their healthcare provider. Um, and, you know, if they're able to, uh, you know, have their vaccination in their healthcare provider's office, um, you know, we can distribute vaccine to any healthcare provider and are, are still doing so. Um, as well, there are opportunities for those that are having difficulty can certainly call the health unit. Um, we will help them navigate to a place to um, make an appointment and or, um, you know, on a minimal basis, we are also vaccinating individuals um, within our office for uh, pediatric appointments. So there definitely is availability um, for those who are interested. And um, if anyone is having difficulty, we would encourage them to go to our website or give us a call at the health unit and we'll definitely help them find a place. Thank you for that. Also, I wanted to ask you about the uptake of fourth dose shots. Uh, how has that been going since we last spoke? Um, well, we'll be updating. Go ahead, Nicole. Go ahead, Shinger. Yeah, we'll be updating uh, those data elements uh, later today at noon. Um, we do encourage people who are eligible for um, uh, uh, the booster doses to take the vaccines and come up to date. I am concerned that the vaccinate that you know with waning immunity and a lower population of people who are up to date that. Um, uh, uh, that may lead to additional cases and challenges uh, in the fall. Um, but the actual data will be updated, uh, um, I think, at noon is when the website gets updated with those data elements. All right. And uh, last question is about wastewater data. There's also been some concern about wastewater data showing an increase across the province over the last couple of weeks. I was wondering if we're seeing the same thing here. So, um, um, uh, you know, I, I'd wait till noon until the data elements are released. Um, the one thing I'd say is, is that when one makes an assessment of risk, I think it's important to take all the data elements together and make a, a fulsome assessment uh, of, of risk and wastewater should be taken in the context of the other indicators that we work with as well. Okay, thank you. I uh, will move to questions from CBC. Yes, um, I know that uh, some time ago that the WeChu released information explaining that there were a large number of students that hadn't caught up with their vaccinations. Have we seen any improvement on that? What does it look like uh, right now with, you know, just a couple of weeks out from the school year? Um, I can start. Uh, you know, our vaccine team has been doing an incredible and amazing job um, working, you know, with the community and with parents. Um, and, and we have seen um, quite not a we've seen a pretty considerable decline. So and we'll continue to do so over the next few weeks. We are very hopeful that we'll get to that date or suspension date with zero zero students 
suspended. That's the goal. That's why we've put so much effort into communicating. Um, we have, you know, availability on the phone, updating records. Um, it is quite resource intensive for us right now. Um, but um, I, you know, we are seeing that number uh, significantly decline. And so that's either individuals that are, you know, getting shots that they have missed, or, um, you know, as we said before, a lot of them are, you know, maybe just records that haven't been updated. So all of that work is continuing. Um, we are continuing to offer clinics um, and we'll be doing so in collaboration with our, our school partners as well, making sure that communication is out there and that we have uh, clinics throughout the community uh, continuing right through uh, till the end of September. So. As I said, we'll give a, we can give a more accurate update of, you know, where we are as far as our suspension numbers. But I can tell you they're dropping dramatically as we get closer and closer to the first day of school. Thank you for that. Yeah, and another. If, oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, no, if I could just supplement that, um, the vaccine verification or the vaccine reporting process is really uh, designed, and the focus is to improve the health of the population in the community, and especially to prepare young people and for adulthood to have their vaccines up to date. Typically, and this is not new, the vaccine verification process, which also includes the potential for suspension, but the goal is not to suspend children and young people. Um, the process is designed so that we can prepare people for adulthood. I would say that also that um, um, when we think of the, this is not new, the vaccine verification process has happened for many, many years across different school districts. Some people have are up to date on their vaccines but have not reported it uh, to the public health service. Other people are behind on their vaccines and they'll get their vaccines and then report that to the public health service. There have been immense opportunities for people to come up to date, including clinics run by the public health service but also clinics and, and providers, clinicians, physicians, family physicians, nurse practitioners, making a concerted effort to bring young people up to speed. The second comment I'd share is, is that not all vaccines are, uh, um, are required to be reported on, but we also provide an opportunity for people to get vaccinated against HPV, which is really a very important vaccine, and hepatitis. And I hope that the community members and families and young people will take the opportunity to come up to date on all their vaccines, those that require reporting and those that do not require reporting. Thanks very much. Um, just another question on the back to school theme. Um, what do you think the outlook is for, for COVID-19? What are your concerns for the fall and, and your message to parents and the community? Well, it's always, you know, as doctors, we're reluctant to predict the future. Um, and if there's one thing that we have, I think, understood from COVID-19 is, is that it's an unpredictable, uh, it's, it's an unpredictable item. That being said, I think that there is a, a significant risk in the fall. Uh, in general, respiratory illnesses are, uh, uh, there's a greater burden of respiratory illnesses uh, in the fall. Um, additionally, I think the number of people who are fully vaccinated or are up to date on their vaccine, I think it's a better descriptor, um, is not where we'd like it to be. So I am concerned about additional cases and additional outbreaks and, and um, uh, uh, moving forward in the fall. I'm also concerned about the flu and uh, you know, we have to not only get people up to date on their COVID vaccines, but also on their influenza vaccines. So I think we do have reasons to be concerned moving forward, but I also think that we have opportunities to mitigate the burden of disease in the community overall. I think it's important to recognize that Windsor Essex has suffered disproportionately from COVID when compared to other health districts. And so I think it behooves us to try to be, uh, um, uh, to take as many precautions as we can to minimize the burden of disease. Thank you very much. We'll move to questions from the Windsor Star. Yes, good morning. Uh, why did the health unit feel the need to resume the weekly briefings? 
Um, so we had received um, just with a number of items gearing up to school, some of our vaccination efforts, um, questions related to monkeypox. Um, you know, we were receiving a lot of questions. And so uh, we thought it would be a good idea for us to just resume um, these weekly sessions as noted by Ashley this morning. If, you know, if we don't have any um, burning questions and, and we don't have anything um, that's you know, urgent to share with the community, then uh, we can certainly um, forego them. But uh, we did think just gearing up, it was important to make sure we share information and um, and ensure that the public has the right information at the right time. And if I could supplement that, uh, uh, dialogue has always been one of the cornerstones of public health practice. Uh, uh, and uh, as members of the media, uh, uh, you contribute to the the positive messaging related to important public health issues. I think that uh, before COVID and uh, subsequent to COVID, uh, um, we wanted to engage with uh, our colleagues in the media and the overall community. Sometimes uh, there's more active issues and sometimes there are less active issues. And um, I think we'll take this opportunity to speak to all of you and uh, uh, if there are uh, if there are times when there's less active issues, then we may scale back on these uh, meetings. But I think it, notwithstanding if we have a meeting or not, we're always open to dialogue via uh, via email or in these uh, in person or uh, virtual conferences. Uh, the release on Tuesday mentioned that uh, one of the reasons for the briefings is the changing landscape of COVID-19. How would you characterize the current landscape of COVID-19 in Windsor-Essex? What has the infection curve been like over the past summer? Well, the latest data, I think, will be released at, uh, at noon, and you'll have a chance to look at the data. Um, um, uh, and I think that'll give us sort of an information. I am... Uh, I am concerned about the fall, and I'm concerned about the additional burden of disease. Uh, I think our latest, uh, uh, the latest numbers would indicate we have approximately 650 people who died of COVID. Uh, that's a significant, uh, uh, a significant burden of illness to the community. Um, I think at this point, my concerns, uh, one of my, one of the concerns I would have, and forgive me for belaboring this point, is what happens in the fall as we go to the flu season and we have a greater burden of respiratory disease historically. So I appreciate the health unit's concern, but at this stage, the provincial government seems to be operating under the assumption that the pandemic is over. Um, how do you deal with that conflict? Well, the pandemic is not over. Um, um, I think that uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, the local health unit uh, has to articulate what I think are the priorities for public health, for the public health. Um, COVID is one component of the challenges we face in the public health service. We face other challenges as well, and it's a challenge to the community. We've had, I think the number is, and Ashley could probably share it. I think we had approximately 60 opioid-related deaths, uh, and there was a period of time. Uh, um, uh, um, where we had two weeks with a very, a very significant increase in the number of deaths. I, I think that um, for us at the local health district, we just have to focus our efforts on trying to advance the health of the community. Uh, but I do think that uh, we still have to remain vigilant for COVID, but we also have to remain vigilant for other diseases of public health significance. How receptive do you think the public will be to COVID messaging going forward? Well, I, I think that it's fair to say that people overall in the community have some component of um, fatigue. I think it's a fair characterization that you know it's been a, this is the third year of the pandemic and it's affected every family and every person and every enterprise and every institution. And I, I think it's only normal to want the pandemic to be over. I think that from my perspective, we have to learn to live with COVID like we learn to live with other, uh, uh, other diseases. And, and that means that when we have periods of increased activity, that we probably have to have more public health measures. 
It also means that we have to engage in routine or regular vaccination. Um, uh, it means that we have to make choices based on the risk that's presented to uh, a particular event. Um, I do think that people understand the risks, uh, but I also think that our community and people are fatigued by COVID, and that's entirely natural given the three years that we've had to live through the pandemic. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, we'll move to questions from AM800. Good morning, doctor. I know you said the uh, latest uh, stats will be released at noon, but uh, just looking at the website here, I believe these are last week's stats and kind of going back to Adele's question about fourth doses. It says about 11.6% uh, of the uh, total population have received the fourth dose. Um, are you concerned with that number? That seems low, low to me. Is, is that low for the health unit? No, I am concerned. We are concerned. I think the health unit is concerned. We'd like that number to come up. Um, the more people that are vaccinated, the, uh, the lower the burden of disease. Uh, and so that's something we definitely would like to encourage people to come up to date uh, on their vaccines. Um, 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 and, and I hope that uh, uh, given, I hope that people avail themselves to the vaccine. But 11% is not the number that we want. We want it at a higher number than that. And then, sorry, going to back to CBC's question when they talked about uh, school, um, and you said you were concerned. Uh, are you concerned just uh, about schools or just the, ge the the general community in general with uh, uh, the fall in COVID? Well, the concerns are one: the number of people who actually get COVID. We know COVID is a systemic disease, meaning it affects multiple organ systems. We know some people who get COVID have long COVID symptoms, meaning that they have persistent symptoms they don't completely get they don't get, get better completely so we're worried at an individual level we're also worried with the, uh, the with the disruption that having a lot of sick people would be to schools and uh, uh, as it relates to the instructors as well as the students and missing important activities we also worry about the deaths associated with covid um, uh, uh, 650 deaths uh, is a significant number uh, so I, uh, we're also worried about the hospitalizations that can be imputed or attributed to COVID because uh, when people who present to the hospital with COVID um, um, are admitted, that means that perhaps other services that are important can't be provided to patients. Uh, we're concerned that uh, during the pandemic, uh, the care of some patients for uh, scheduled surgeries or I, I don't like using the word elective surgery, but uh, for scheduled uh, cases that some of those might have been deferred or scheduled investigations might have been deferred. So I think on many, many levels, we are concerned about, uh, uh, we are concerned about COVID. But I also want to share that COVID is only one of the many public health concerns that we have moving forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. We will move to uh, one round with one follow-up question from our outlets, starting with Blackburn. Yes, I wanted to ask you, I know you've had at least one clinic. Uh, how many people have had the monkeypox vaccination? Nicole, are you able to comment on that? Uh... Uh, yeah, I couldn't give you an accurate number. Um, I know, but we've um, delivered over a hundred at this point, and and we are our team is working on uh, with our community partners as we as we had stated before on uh, additional uh, clinics for um, for prep. So um, you know we hope to continue vaccinating those that are at risk or and and or eligible for for that vaccine. But um, at this point, it's not an exact number, but we've definitely vaccinated more than a hundred. Thank you. And one follow-up question from CBC. Yes, is there any more information available about uh, monkeypox in our community? Have we seen any spread? I know there was that one case. Yeah, you know, um, um, uh, the number of people in the community who uh, have monkeypox, uh, I'm not, I, I think that we, it's important to recognize that there are hundreds of people across the province who have had monkeypox. 
I prefer not to comment on the, the exact number of people in the health district who have uh, had monkeypox. I do think that the burden of disease with monkeypox is increasing as well. And I would look towards the provincial data. We can have our epidemiologists share that data with you uh, as we understand it. I think that one thing that, to think about with monkeypox is that we have a vaccine to prevent uh, transmission and in, in individuals that might be at higher risk for contracting monkeypox, we're trying to offer the vaccine and there are medications to treat monkeypox as well. And so uh, if people have uh, developed the disease that we can offer the medications. And, that, and I think those are both positive uh, items as it relates to the management of monkeypox. Thank you. One follow-up question from the Windsor Star. Yes, Dr. Nessasura, just uh, in followance of your uh, comments about uh, opioid alerts in the region, what, what is the progress on the consumption and treatment services side at this point? So perhaps I can ask Nicole to comment on that because she follows more of these operational items, but I, I think it's uh, the consumption and treatment site is one uh, part of a multifaceted approach to help manage the opioid crisis. Uh, Nicole, um, perhaps you could supplement my comment. Yeah, sure. If you could just repeat the question, I, I didn't catch it all. The, consens the consumption and treatment services site, what is the progress on establishing it at this point? Has, a, has an end date been, in this, uh, been set? Yeah, we don't really have an exact end date. I, I think our date was to be open as soon as possible. Um, there is some work that we have to do um, to get it ready. So um, there's modifications that are required um, to the actual space itself. And so we are working on that. Uh, and now it requires, um, you know, permits and, and some uh, construction, et cetera. Um, so things like just making sure uh, we have accessible bathrooms, you know, looking at the size of the doorway. So there are some modifications that have to happen to the to the building itself. Um, as you know, and we've reported, we have put in um, uh, application for an urgent public health needs site through Health Canada. Um, and as well, after uh, receiving our um, approval from the city of Windsor, we, we did submit for our full application for a permanent uh, site, as well as we're able then to submit uh, for, for permanent funding through the Ministry of Health. And we, ha and we are working with um, both of those agencies right now as they review um, our submissions and applications. So we are in really uh, good shape. Our application was uh, very thorough and um, and we are just working through, you know, getting everything in order to, um, you know, make sure that the physical site itself is ready. So progress is being made. I, I know it may not seem like it, um, but there is a lot of work that goes into it. So I can't unfortunately give a, a date, but, um, you know, hopefully uh, it won't be too much longer. I would, you know, I would say for construction, I mean, we're a little bit at the mercy of timelines, but um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, in the next few months, we'll we'll be able to see an opening of that. Wait, wait, just uh, I'm sorry. Your last comment there. You're you're hoping that the site will open within the next few months. I I can't give you an exact date, but I would hope within the next few months we would see we would see uh, the ability to open it. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, follow up question from AM800. I'm good. Thank you. And I believe we have a question from CTV. Yeah, sorry, just came off the bench, late game edition. Uh, hi, Nicole. Hi, Dr. Hi, Ashley. Um, just going back to the COVID topic, I guess, if I may. I heard you guys talking about it when I jumped on. So just a quick question here. So people who have had COVID or, or recently or, uh, you know, and don't plan on, uh, you know, boosting up, you know, what, thinking they could just weather the storm because they've already had it, uh, what do you say to them heading into the fall? Well, I, I think that uh, um, there's definitely an advantage to getting vaccinated, and uh, and, um, and I would encourage people to become up to date on their vaccines. I also think that for some people who get COVID, it's not a uh, um, it, um, it's not a uh, item that fully resolves. I think vaccination is likely to diminish the chances of, quote, long COVID, unquote, or the longer sequelae of having COVID. I think also, um, you know, um, 
getting vaccinated uh, in general, getting vaccinated helps you and it helps other people. Um, the less sick people that we have in the community, the less people that are, are using healthcare resources, which means that healthcare resources can be used by uh, people who have other illnesses and cause and try to at least get caught up on services that we might have been behind on. So I would encourage people to get up to date. I think it's the right thing to do. And um, um, uh, uh, I hope that people avail themselves to that opportunity. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. That concludes our media session. Uh, our next media session is planned for Thursday, August 25th, unless otherwise noted. Uh, thank you all again. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thanks for everything. Take care. Thank you.